to Online for Authors, where I, Terry M. Brown, author of character-driven fiction and host of the podcast, introduce readers to characters they'd love to invite to lunch by interviewing authors, discussing their books, learning about the writing process, and even, on occasion, chatting live with a panel of authors to discuss topics relevant to both readers and writers. My guest today on the Online for Authors podcast is Melissa C. Diaferia, author of the book Sugar Plum and the Right Winger. Melissa is a talented independent romance author from Toronto, Ontario. She is known to focus on her Italian heritage, musicality, sports, and her love for romance-based plots. In my book review, I stated Sugar Plum and the Right Winger is a clean, quick read romance. This novella features Bea, a ballerina, and Teo, a Toronto Blues hockey player. As with any good romance, neither Bea nor Teo are completely honest about their attraction. Plus, Bea is keeping a secret, one that could stop the romance in its tracks before it really gets started. One thing I really enjoyed was that the novella includes songs, and Melissa provides readers with the song list, including numbers from the Broadway musical Hamilton, as well as singers like Elvis, Bocelli, and Michael Buble. Sugar Plum and the Right Winger is the first in the Toronto Blues series. And by the way, the Toronto Blues is not a real NHL hockey team. The real Toronto team is the Maple Leafs. And yes, I had to look that up. Today on Online for Authors, I'm chatting with Melissa Diaferia, author of the novella Sugar Plum and the Right Winger. Welcome, Melissa. Hi, Terry. Thank you for having me today. Oh, thank you so much for being with me. Before we really jump into the book, I would like you to give listeners just a really quick elevator speech. What are they going to find when they read this book? So it's going to be a very short novella about young adults in Toronto um, working through their careers in hockey and ballet and a lot of clean romance, but romance nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. I loved the fact that it was clean romance. I have, I, I don't know, I have a very good imagination and I don't need someone giving me all of the details. And so I like the fact that it didn't go there, you know, where we had to like close our eyes and wonder who was watching me read. So that was, right. that was lovely. Right. So um, very quickly though, I do want to say to our listeners that we now have a sponsor and it is, so let's let's put it this way. If you want to keep this book discussion going, head on over to Novels and Latte Book Club on Facebook. I'm going to have the link in the show notes. Um, as a member of this amazing community, you'll have the opportunity to win a digital copy of Melissa's book. Um, so uh, Sugar Plum and the Right Winger. So head on over today, join the community, find the post and you will be able to win a copy or be in the running to win a copy of this. Um, what made you decide to pair a ballet dancer with a hockey player? Um, it's a combo I don't really see often. <laughs> ever? <laughs> yeah, ever. <laughs> but the funny thing is, like, so in, I believe, I think it was last year, last hockey season, my dad had this amazing opportunity to see the, the playoffs live it was Toronto Maple Leafs versus the Florida Panthers and every game that they had at home he brought me to and I had never been to a hockey game before so right away I was I was in love with the sport not just the idea of like the hockey players that they're all you know the typical sportmen and that they're big right. and they're hot and whatever but I actually really did enjoy the sport and I've always loved ballet and dance because I didn't do it like professionally or anything just in school there was an opportunity to do that. And I actually got to visit the National Ballet. And they also were so captivating. And then I saw this hockey guys and they were they were also as interesting. So I was originally actually writing a story about a ballerina and some kind of like dystopian like royalty. That's originally how it started. Mm -hmm. So if anyone's read my my book yet or if they've just even read the back you know that the main character in the male is uh, Matteo so originally he was Prince Matteo <laughs> and okay. I was like I think I think I like a hockey player a little bit more <laughs> than, a, than a prince right now right well and I love that 
I love to see because what we have are two extremely athletic people in two extremely athletic sports that are really very different. You know, ballet is is considered so graceful and and quiet, you know, and soft, whereas hockey is like powerful and loud and, you know, sticks flying and teeth flying sometimes. Right. And yeah. so to, to see the two of these paired together, I just thought it was it was I think that's really what made the book for me as much as the story is fabulous. But this idea that you've paired these two people that somehow shouldn't have met. Yeah. Their worlds should have never collided. And yet her sister, unwittingly, you know, she doesn't setting anything up, but brings her, her sister is a, what, social media with the hockey team yeah. and brings her sister and pretty much forces her sister, come on to the game, come on to the game. <laughs> and then, you know, love starts to happen. So I loved that. I thought it was a really good, I'm glad you changed him from a prince to a hockey player. I think that it worked really well for you. There's so many princes out there right now. <laughs> well, and that's, you know, and the thing is, is, is a ballet dancer and a prince would have been a nice story, but I don't know that it would have stood out differently. Whereas this story, the hook here in this story is, is that you have two very different sports to de very different athletes who don't meet you you know like hockey can be played at the olympics but you don't see ballerinas there like there isn't a, a place for them to naturally meet yeah and so for them to to come together is just it's just really cool i, I loved and i loved the play and it allowed you to do crazy things like um the the scene that i loved was when you brought the hockey team to see her dance yeah. Right. You know, these big burly guys, you know, sitting in their uncomfortable suits, you know, watching this, watching this. And I thought that that was that was really great. Thank you. I really appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. So how much research did you have to do to make this realistic? Uh, so when it came to the ballet part, because it had been more um, it had been many years that I had already researched and studied it and just kind of obsessed over it honestly right, for, right. for such a period of time uh that I had already known most about like I knew the point shoes aren't actually made of wood they're made of like a plaster and like a mache and you know I knew you have to smack them against the floor so these things I was like no actual ballerinas would do this right um and I knew like the positions at the bar like everyone has their own position like you don't take another dancer's spot these small little things, I was like, no, 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 I can fit this in perfectly. But then when it came to the hockey part, I was learning <laughs> the rules of hockey as my dad was, like, telling me them in my ear at the game. And I was like, dad, like, we're going to have to talk later. <laughs> I'm like, so what does icing mean? I'm like, what does this mean? I'm like, why is that guy over there? <laughs> right. Like, what what, what are they doing now? Yeah. Right. I'm like, what do they do before the game? What do they do after the game? Would it be realistic for, like, somebody to you know, come up to the glass of a hockey game, like, right before, so, and apparently it is, and I actually got the chance to do that, so, um, I was like, no, these things, I had no idea before, but the more I learned about it, the more I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> right, right, I love the, the ability to do research, and find that, that link, that thing, that is going to make my story move forward, so, you know, when you found out, like, can they talk beforehand, well, yes, they can, oh, that's how they're going to initially meet, you yeah. know, or, or like, you know, would it be possible for someone to skate around on the ice prior to, you know, mm -hmm. before, before everyone's there, is that allowed? Are they allowed out on the ice or, or would that be, you know, against the rules or, and then when you say, oh yes, they are, well, that gives them a chance to do something or, you know, could, could someone rent an arena or could, you know, what happens after a game? Are there, are there these special boxes for the wives and girlfriends at the top? You know, all of those things that as you find it out and you think, oh, that's what I could do next. That's how I could make this happen. So. Because the thing I hate most is reading a book and knowing about a topic and then reading this book about that particular topic or whatever, but it's a fictional romance and then seeing so many inconsistencies. And I'm like, well, now you've taken me out of the book because out now I'm just book. criticizing it. Exactly. And I think that's the, the thing, whether you're writing historical fiction, contemporary fiction, whatever you're writing, if you're writing about anything real, mm -hmm. you have to do it in such a way that it doesn't jerk the reader 
right out of the book. I was reading a story that was a historical fiction, and I, I can't remember now what the word was, but they used a word, and the word was a very modern term. <laughs> now, it stopped me dead, took me totally out of the story. I looked the word up. I found out it did exist a long time ago, but we now use it in a very modern, computer-oriented way. <laughs> and even though it existed then, it's a word that you shouldn't use in historical fiction because people associate it with modern day internet connected computing. Right. You know, and it was like, oh, what was that? And so it's that kind of thing where you're really having to look and say, does this, for someone who knows hockey, are they going to read this and understand it could happen? Or are they going to be pulled so out of the story that it's no longer no longer good so yeah good job with that thank you and it's also sharing like too like the sports both sports with people who don't know much about it you want to uh, kind of right. teach them as as you see so that's why I, it might seem a little obvious sometimes when I explain like a rule in hockey or something that has to do with you know a particular section of the ballet but I want people to actually learn a little bit about it exactly and then, Right. And then like they can research it on their own and hopefully, you know, enjoy these things and go and see these things in right. their own hometown. Right. I know nothing about hockey. <laughs> I actually had to look up to find out if the, the hockey team that you have was real. And I found that out was it was the not. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> I found out it was off. not. It's the it's the maple leaves are real in yes. Toronto. And yes. you have them named, I can't remember what was the name that you the Toronto Blues, because the I blues. wanted to stay tr true to my home. <laughs> I'm from okay. Toronto. Right. Uh, I've always been here. So I was like, I can't choose an American city. I don't, honestly, I've only been to two states in my life. So I was like, I don't know much about America. <laughs> right, right. So but I know Toronto. Where you know, right? Yeah. I'm like, right. I know Toronto really well. <laughs> well, so, and I thought, I'll bet Toronto does have a hockey team. So I had to look it up. I just had <laughs> to know. And it was like, nope, they're not the Blues. They're the, they're the Maple Leafs. So that was good. Tell me a little bit about your author journey. Like, have you always wanted to be a writer? Is this, is this, did it come out of nowhere? Is this something you've been doing since you were three? Like, how did you get to what, what you're doing now? Um, so that's a funny question. Uh, because recently we were just cleaning up and my mom found stories that I wrote when I was in kindergarten. <laughs> and she's like, see, I told you, you were always going to write. And although that's true, I never saw it to be something that I could actually <clears throat> like make money from or or right. share with people I thought it was honestly stuff that I could just keep to myself and just do it for the sake of doing it kind of like a like a in a way like a therapeutic kind of thing just right. getting all my creativity down and all my ideas um I used to post this is so I hate that I'm admitting this but I used to post on Wattpad <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, do you know what's interesting? I've never done that. I'm, I'm much older than you. I'm 60 <laughs> and Wattpad just, but my daughter, I have a daughter who's 25 and she used to post all her stories on Wattpad as well. So yeah. Yeah. I used to do that all the time. And I was like, it's just a random thing. I was like, once a week I would do like a chapter here or there. And it was stories about nothing, like nothing, nothing crazy, nothing that I kind of memorable but stuff that got, me, got the bad ideas out of the way to make room for the good, for the ones. good ones right right um but yeah like during COVID I was just like now what <laughs> I was like now what do I do uh, I was finishing up school so um I kind of had more time on my hands because everything was online and I, I tended to fly through school anyway so I was like I have a whole day now <laughs> so that's what now I wrote what? right yeah right so I was like I, I need something to fill the time so I wrote courtesy of which is my first um my first novella. It's not related to the Toronto Blues series. It's just a standalone on its own. Standalone. Okay. Yeah. Because I was taking um, a romance writer class. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, the the teacher was Priscilla Oliveras. I don't know if you know that author. I've heard the name. Yeah. Yeah. And she was great. She was great at showing and correcting and, but like, in such a way that I wasn't discouraged because that's happened before where yeah. I've shared what I've written before and I didn't want to share it anymore because someone kind of t tore it down too much. Right. And I think there's a right. really nice balance. <laughs> there is. Well, and, and the thing is, is when you are critiquing someone's work, you need to make sure that you're finding the places where they're strong mm. and then also the places where they're not as strong, where you can see some improvement, but you have to say it in a way that doesn't make them feel like they'll never achieve that. 
Right. And that was the thing that I was struggling with on Wattpad was because it was anybody can critique anything. Exactly. And it was, and again, like for reference, I'm 21 next week. So I was, during COVID, I was much younger. Uh, I was a teenager and I was writing on Wattpad and people were saying how awful it was. And, and I agree, but <laughs> I agree now. But, but, that, but that's not, that's not what you needed to hear. No, no. It, it and isn't that kind right. Of, and that kind of hinders you from continuing exactly. to want to share things with people. Right. Right. right but exactly. on a whim, honestly, my, no one knew I was writing courtesy of, no one knew I published it. I just kind of hit the, pre- the press button on KDP and I told my parents, I was like, hey, by the way, I just published a book to Amazon. And they were like, <laughs> you did what? You did what? Like, we had no yeah. idea. And I was like, yeah, if you want one, I'll order you one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the way to do it. I think that's wonderful. If, you know, so you're, you're young starting. I was very old starting. I was 58 when my first book came out. So, you know, a big, a big change in like what I did versus what you're doing. What would you say to other, you know, teens and early 20s who are saying to themselves, well, I kind of want to write, but I'm afraid to, or I don't really know what I'm doing, or what if nobody likes it, or those kinds of things? What would you, what would you say to them? My, my heart really does go out to those kids because uh, I, I was the kind of person that I never told anybody what I was doing. So if they were to... I hope, I hope whoever they were to confide in to tell people like, oh, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to go about it. Like, these are my ideas. I hope that there's people around them that foster creativity and that would tell them, you know, first off, my advice, turn off the comments on your Wattpad account. If you're going to write, <laughs> right. <laughs> turn off the comments. Right. But keep writing on it. I'm telling, I'm telling you, it, it was a lot of nothing. <laughs> but that I wrote, but it was, again, it's just getting the ball rolling, even with the bad ideas, because they're not going to be fantastic off the, off the bat, or, you know, maybe you'll be the next JK Rowling, like, who knows, but <laughs> it, it's tough to, to make your first story, like, the story that gets you going. Yeah, yeah, no, my, my first, my first manuscript, it will never see the light of day. It, it was really, it was not good. But it taught me a lot of things. And it taught me that I had those words, and that I had the ability to write a story of that length. And, you know, it had characters and it had, I mean, it had the right elements. And it taught me things It also taught me things I needed to work on. Mm-hmm. And it was like, Absolutely. okay, so my, my characters are kind of flat. And what do I need to do here? And what, how do I, how do I do this? And oh, I need my characters to have more problems. All of my characters were too perfect in that first story. And you know, you just you start learning, you don't learn to write by reading about it. You learn to write by writing. That's and, the only way. Yeah. I mean, it'd be like saying I'm going to become a famous tennis player because I read a book on it, you know, <laughs> I would get out on the tennis court and be creamed because I don't know anything about the game. And it's the same with writing. And then the other thing that I tell people, and I'm sure you believe, is you can't edit something that's not written. So the only way to make something better is to get that first part out on the paper. And now you can say, okay, what do I need to do to make this a better version of what I had in my head? What does Mm -hmm. it need? You know, like... Like maybe your character is too flat. Well, what can you do to change that? Or maybe you don't have enough in the setting. What can you do to change that? Or maybe the character doesn't change enough or doesn't have enough issues. Like what could you add? How could you make the tension stronger? Those kinds of things. Right? I always I always had the issue that actually the opposite, that my characters were too flawed. Too flawed. I, okay. Yeah. And I would Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. I think, and so, it's, you know, that's something else to learn is there is a balance. Yeah. And like, and even like just the way that I would write women before was hilarious because I'm a woman and I would write these weak characters and I'm going, I, it, 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 it changes the way that I saw myself too. I'm like, do I really see myself like this? Is that how I want to, you know, demonstrate a woman? in a romance story do I want her to be dependent and weak and frail or do I want her to represent how I want to be and how I am right so I made her a little tougher and a little right each story I think if you read all three of my books you could see from the courtesy of to the last which is wedding dates and hockey skates so far 
you could see the progression of the woman just becoming um coming into herself and becoming tougher and just not depending right. so much on on how a man feels which i i like that yeah no and i think i think we all do that as we write that we start to learn who we are and as you learn more about who you are and you have more experiences in your own life those will start showing up in your writing as well Absolutely. so yeah i like that are you a plotter or a pantser do you know what that is no <laughs> Okay, so a plotter is someone who writes down, has an outline, knows where the story is going when they get started, and a pantser kind of sits down and writes by the seat of their pants, and the story starts evolving as they write. Yeah, that sounds more like me. You're okay. All yeah, right. Yeah. And, yeah, and so am I. I have some friends who are plotters, and they will put down, they'll have like 41 points, and they have it all written, and they know where they're going to go. And I tried that one time, and my characters refused to play. And they stood over on the side of the wall with their arms crossed and said, nope, we're not doing this with you. And I had, they had to wait until I came to my senses and did it my way. Um, right. So yeah, there's, there's different ways to write. So you do, you, I have characters in my head. Do you have characters in your head? Like people that I would, I would want to write. Yeah. But I mean that, that like mine actually chat with me as I'm writing. I mean, I feel like they're there and they're really with me or, or do you, is this your imagination and you feel very sure that it's coming from you? I always wonder if I have another person living in my head. See, for me, I feel like every time I'm writing, so I like to write in like the third person point of view because yes. you can see everybody's opinion yes. and everybody's point of view. I really enjoy that. So when I'm writing, for example, Sugar Plum, uh, we have Bea and we have Mateo. With Mateo, if, if I'm writing about him, I'll step into that kind of mindset of I'm a hockey player, I'm a dude. <laughs> right. What would I do as a dude? Or what do I want to, if I'm a man, if I'm a hockey player, how do I want to be perceived first? And second, what do I want to see ideally in a man that's a hockey player? So I'm trying to be him, <laughs> if that makes sense. Right. I'm trying to be right. her. Right. Right. Oh, no, I love that. Yeah. I love. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Um, I like to write in third person. All three of my my books are in third person. I'm currently writing a first person. And I decided to do that to do something different and shake it up a little for myself as an author. Um, mm -hmm. I think that sometimes you learn more when, you know, like I got very comfortable. Yeah. And I write in third person very I don't know, easily, it just comes very naturally to me. Writing in first person has been a much harder thing to do, but I think it's good because I'm learning a lot about the writing process while I'm doing it. So I shake it up a little bit. So when I used to write on Wattpad, it's funny, I used to always write in first person point of view. And because again, a young, younger mind for me, it was so much easier to just be like, I did this, like, I wanted I did, this. Right. To think more more selfishly i'm like no i'm thinking all about like me as the character and then i started alternating point of views because that was a big thing in wattpad was like at the top you put like this person's point of view and one right. chapter is each person that was just confusing for me and then courtesy of i was just like no i need everybody's collective thought but i do have plans for so the next toronto blues book is coming out soon hopefully eventually yeah uh, I'm not putting much pressure on it, just it comes when it comes. And uh, that's going to be obviously third because the rest of the series is. But I'm working on something for the next book standalone that's going to be first. So we'll chat about that. <laughs> because yeah, maybe we can help no, each I mean, other. I think that would I think that would be excellent because there it is. It's a very different thing because in third person, like you said, you get the opportunity to get in other people's heads. And so you know what's going on, but you know what's going on from all of your character's point of view. Well, when you write in this first person, the only character you're in is that person. And you have other characters, but you only know what's going on with them based on something they've said out loud or something your main character has witnessed. Exactly. And it's and it's hard. It's much harder to to stay in that. I've I've found it very, very challenging, but it's it's a lot of fun. So it is. Do you see yourself writing in any other genre other than the romance genre? So, yeah, yes and no, because I, I like to write what I know. <laughs> I don't know much about, like, I'm not, a, I'm not very big on, you know, sci-fi person or right. um, stuff like that. Like, historical is really not my thing either. But that being said, I love Outlander. <laughs> um, so you never know. You might like it, right? 
<laughs> Maybe. I like watching it and I like reading it, but writing it, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, ideally, I would love to write eventually um, kind of like um, like a biography, not about mm-hmm. myself, but about my grandparents, actually, because all four of them came from Italy in like the 50s, yeah. leaving, yeah. you know, poverty and everything and just the kind of life that they built for us here. Right. Um, I, I think that their stories deserve to be told. I'm I'm fortunate enough that I'm 21 years old and I have two grandparents still around. Um, but I want to make sure their stories kind of listen. There's a thing I heard that it says if a if a writer is in love with you or loves you, you never die because you're going to be in all of their work. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is true. I tell people right. all the time: be careful what you say in front of me. It's going to make it into a book. You know. <laughs> I haven't, this is, again, I hope my friends aren't watching, but when we have conversations or whatever, like I have a note on my phone of things that my friends say that are quotable. Yes. No, I do, the, I do the same thing. I, I write stuff down. I hear something and I think, ooh, ooh. Um, I'm currently, so I'm currently writing a story about a woman who is going through menopause. And it is, it's humorous. It's, it's all the funny things. She has hot flashes at all the wrong times and, and that kind of thing. And every now and then something will happen to me or a friend will bring something up and I'll think, oh, that's perfect. That's exactly what I need to do. I have a friend who had to put her dog in the bathroom because they were having their floors done. And when she opened up the door to the bathroom, the dog had eaten a bar of soap oh. and, and, was, and was blowing bubbles everywhere. Right. Oh now, no dogs were hurt in this. The dog is fine. But nonetheless, oh, no. and that story is so funny. And my book has a lot of humor in it that I can see something like that happening. And so immediately I wrote down, you know, dog bubbles. You know, I've got to make <laughs> sure that that happens. So same kind of thing. Things happen and it's like, oh, that would be perfect for this character. Right. Exactly. Right. Um, so that would be, what do you think? Is it going to be more like a, fi- they call them family memoirs where it's a, it's your, your family's memoir. Would it be a hundred percent true or would you take their stories and fictionalize them? That's an option. Uh, yeah. I liked, I liked that option. Cause I think I'm better at, I'm better at um, embellishment, but I want to make sure the main points don't get lost. Right. Um, but I listen, like it, it was a different day back then. Like, for example, my grandparents, my dad's parents, they met through letters. Right. Through a church and just sending pictures and letters back and forth. And the day they met each other was a week before their wedding. Isn't that crazy? So yeah. that's like there are so many love stories out there that just they're not they're not um we don't hear much about them now because people don't do that. <laughs> or most people do don't do that. Um, but I think, I think it's cool to, to yeah. write something about that and, you know, show a different way of falling in love because there are so many different ways. And I think we're so used to the meat cutes and the coffee shops and all those are great, but there was, there's other ways, you know? Right. Right. And, and, and it used to happen very differently. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I know. So for me, my second book, An Enemy Like Me is, um, I say very loosely based on my grandfather. And his story. And um, he fought in World War II. He fought in Germany. We're of German descent. He fought in Germany. And one time he said to me when I was a teenager, he said, I always wondered if the person on the other side of my gun was a cousin. And that's really stuck with me. So I took a lot of his stories, a lot of our family stories, a lot of things my father told me. And it's fiction. But if you know my family, you will see a lot of truth in there. In fact, when my daughter read it, she would call me up sometimes and say, okay, this piece right here, did this really happen? You know, I'm reading along and I know this is family story, but I've never heard this one. It was like, no, that was your mother embellishing. That was (laughs) (laughs) like highlight all the embellishments. (laughs) Here's the pieces that are real. But yeah, there's certain times where she's like, did that really happen? Oh no. Sorry, hon. That was me you know, adding something to just, you know, add a little bit of of pizzazz to the book, but (laughs) wonderful. So what do you think is the hardest part about being an author? Mm, That's a tough one. (laughs) It's, uh, so it's not my day job. It's not my, my full-time job. It's on the side. Um, I'm a jack of all trades. So finding time for it is, is hard. Um, 
just last week I was volunteering um, as a summer camp counselor. <laughs> so that okay. wiped me out. <laughs> right, right. So, there's no there's no writing when that's going on. I got yeah. nothing done. Uh, right. <laughs> but again, worth it. But I got nothing done. Um, I'm going back to college in September. So I'm not sure how much time I'll have for that. It's just finding the time. And then when I have the time, making sure that the inspiration aligns with the time. (laughs) That is hard for me because I have friends that are, you know, they write every morning at 6 a.m. until 10 or whatever it is that they do. And I can't do that because I'll get up and I'll sit in front of my computer and it's like, I got nothing. My inspiration isn't here yet. And so I can write for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours when I have the inspiration. I can't schedule my creativity. Yeah. yeah I have trouble and with that too. I don't know about you, but mostly for me, it kind of hits at like maybe nine o'clock at night, like right before I'm about to go to bed. So I'm like, I'm just going to set one hour because I know I need to sleep. If I don't sleep. Right. Game then over. it's no good. <laughs> right. Right. But I'm like, I'll write what I can, what whatever is in my head, just word vomit for an hour yeah. and I'll fix it in the morning. Because if I go to sleep with these ideas in my head, I'm not going to remember them in the morning or two, they're going to change. And I'm not sure if I'm going to like that. <laughs> so right. exactly. I have to get it out. I love how you just used word vomit. I use that. That's my yeah. term where I tell people, I just, I just like throw it up onto the page and then I go fix it. I do not try to wordsmith it as I'm writing it. I go ahead and let the story just get out of me. Yeah. And then I work on fixing it because I'm not going to write it perfectly the first time. I'm going to use weak words. I'm not going to have enough explanation. Maybe it isn't even going to quite make sense and I'm going to have to change things up some, but I go ahead and get out what's here out. And then editing. Yeah. And editing is a very different thing. I use a whole different part of my brain at that point. I'm being more logical and just sitting and like figuring out like what needs to happen next. And then you have to bring the creativity brain back in so that you can write it. And then, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I love that you do that and that you have found that nighttime is the best time for you. Yeah. Cause during the day, I just, I have so many things that are, that are on the, on the go and my house is never quiet. So I'm like, I just, right. I can't, I can't focus. Like I can't, um dedicate time to this unless I actually have nothing left to do in the day and for me right before bed (laughs) it seems to be that time right fantastic so Melissa if someone wanted to reach out to you and learn more about your blue series or about what's coming up next or even talk to you about what you used to put out there on Wattpad (laughs) how do they get up with you uh y'all can find me on Instagram I have an Instagram page um recently they gave me this feature on Instagram where I can I had a sorry, I have a broadcast channel. So that's pretty cool. And yeah. it's just like updates on my life and stuff. Like I've been YouTubing to, is that a verb now? YouTubing? Yeah, I YouTube. That's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been YouTubing as well, like vlogs for the summer right? and just stuff like that. So fantastic um, updates and stuff there. I have a website as well. That okay. one's more so for if you want info on like the books um, okay. to see like more about how I kind of got here, (laughs) what I'm doing here. Good. I will put all of those links uh, in the show notes. So, you know, reach right out to Melissa. Definitely. If you read her books, let's, you know, help her out, get onto Amazon, give her some, you know, love, give her some stars, let her know what you think. Right. That's always a good thing for, for authors. And just more than anything, Melissa, I want to thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me, Terry. My first podcast I think it went well. <laughs> it did. It went, it went very well. And I'm so thankful <laughs> that you were able to come on. So, Melissa, thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Terry. And thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. I really appreciate that. Thank you for listening to Online for Authors, where I, Terry M. Brown, author of character driven fiction and host of the podcast, introduce readers to characters they'd love to invite to lunch. Tune in next Tuesday for another podcast episode.